time to have some fun, everybody. Hello, my friends, and welcome to The Book Refuge, and welcome to Season 7, Episode 1 of Outlander. This is called A Life Well Lost, and we're back for some Outlander recaps and um, breakdowns. Whatever this is, this thing I've been doing for, I think, almost four years now, it is time. And so um, I haven't opened this bottle since the last time um, I did one of these. So I'm just gonna pour myself a teeny tiny little bit because I'm sure this is aged. Ooh, just as good as gasoline, but we will have ourselves a wee drum, oh drum, whatever. I'm not cool, I'm not Scottish, I'm just a fan of the books and TV show. But this is my beautiful bottle of the Sassanac um, blended scotch whiskey, one of the limited batch releases that I got. Um, this bottle cost me way too much and I'm not someone who is a big whiskey person, but I had to have it. I had to have the bottle, I had to have it. And here it sits and oh my gosh, my face is gonna get even redder. I have a little bit of sunburn under here, but also when I drink some of this, it's gonna get even worse and I have my Diet Coke here as a chaser, but let's do it. How, okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm bouncing all over. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Can you believe we're finally back? Droughtlander is finally over and it's time for us to dive in. I just can't wait. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I can't believe it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's do this and then we'll get into it. <sighs> okay, I need my Coke. Got my Coke Zero ready to, ready to chase this. Oh yeah. Let's get it going, man. All right. All right. If you're new to one of these, let me just say, okay, I don't do a lot of movie and TV reviewing content. That's not my main bag. I know that. Some of you have found me because of my Outlander content and you've stuck around for this crazy ride and you have just been waiting so, so patiently for me to get to this. Um, and I wanted to have it up immediately, but I happened to be away. It looks this year that the episodes will always be available at 11 p.m. on Thursdays instead of 11, 11 p.m. on Saturdays. And so my hope is that I will have watched these and these episodes will be able to go up on, I don't know which day I'm going to do them, whether I will put them on Saturdays or Sundays or if I'll put them on Mondays. This one will be going up on a Tuesday because again I was gone this weekend and so I have other videos I have to get out first um, and these videos have always been kind of a pet project for me. I have a whole Outlander playlist and you'll see that Outlander is so close. It is deep deep in my heart and soul so I will always keep making these videos but I also have an entire other channel that is focused on romance novels and so making these videos though it is a passion of mine I still have to fit in everything else so I think it will end up that these ones will go up on Mondays and they're kind of like my bonus video because I still have um, three to four videos that I put out every week for my main stuff but yeah that's just what I'm thinking that's what my plan is my plan is that it will always get out there um, but this next week it will probably be a Tuesday as well because I'm gone this next one, this next weekend as well. Um, but after that, once we're on a consistent schedule for the season, that is when I'm thinking it's going to happen. So some other things to do before we fully dive into this episode. Um, it's been a long, long time. I know I get requests all year long, um, pretty much every month, someone asking for more Outlander content. And I mean, I completely get it. I'm an Outlander um, obsessed person too. I absolutely am. But for me, I really like to keep it focused on the TV episodes as it is now, um, unless I eventually do a reread of Outlander, just because it's not like I've stopped loving it or I my love for it's going away. It's just that 
it's I'm not going to be the channel that's constantly coming up with new things and new parts of Outlander to pick apart. It's just something I love. It's deep in my DNA. Jamie and Claire are some of my favorite characters ever written on a page. So I'm always willing to talk about them with people. I'm happy to chat if you want to. But I think this is where I'm just kind of sitting with Outlander content is that I will continue reviewing the show until it's finished. And then, you know, just whenever they come up, whenever there's a time for me to mention it, I absolutely will. But I don't know how much other focused content I'll have besides that. So anyway, okay. So if you've never watched one of my previous reviews, I mean, hi, hello. I'm so glad you stumbled across this. If you don't know, I do have a playlist over here that has my review of all of Outlander. For the first four seasons, I had season reviews of the show. Um, was it four or did I just do three? Wow. Now I don't even remember. Now I don't even remember. I think the first four seasons I did season wrap ups. And then for seasons five, and six, I did individual reviews for the episodes and that was amazing. I loved doing that so much and that's why I always come back with it. Even though these aren't my most popular videos that I do, they are a pet project for me and I adore them. So how does it go in these? Well, my process has changed over time as I've made these, but the way that I've liked it the best is that I do a quick recap of the episode. So I just, you know, say how I felt watching it and my reactions. I've seen this episode twice. I watched it the first time on Friday morning, um, but I had to watch it on my phone because like I said, I was on vacation. And then when I got back today, I just rewatched it and I took some notes. And that's how I really like to do it because I like to be able to watch it twice. The first time I don't like to have to be taking notes or thinking about things unless I just do. Like there were a couple notes I took on my computer when I was watching it on my phone because I was like, oh, I want to remember that thought as I had it. Um, but otherwise, I just like to watch it first as a watcher and someone who just loves these characters so much. And then I watch it for kind of my analysis and my thoughts, which is what you're here for. So yeah, so first we'll do a little like recap of the episode of what we saw. And then I will do a part where I kind of compare it with the book. I am a book lover first, even though I always say this, the TV show is what made me aware of the books and made me finally like read them. Um, but very quickly, my love of the books surpassed my love of the show. So I will be critical of the show if I need to be. I definitely have some scathing reviews in the past of certain episodes that just ticked me off. Um, but sometimes they're just awesome. And then I'm just like, I didn't have a problem with any of the changes or anything. So we're seven minutes in already and we're going to get going with this. And we'll talk about why I'm holding up a breath of snow and ashes instead of an echo in the bone, which is what other people have been holding up since this is season seven. But we'll have some stuff to talk about. Okay, we'll get, to, we'll get to that stuff. Let's start with our quick recap of the episode. I need my Diet Coke because that whiskey is literally still burning my throat. That's why there's hardly any gone and I've had it for a long time. Okay, so we start this episode pretty much right where we left off with um, season six, which is Claire being put into the jail and Jamie having just been rescued by Ian, um, and they are saddling up their horses to go and rescue Claire. So yeah, Claire is put into the jail and she starts meeting some of the other ladies who are also in prison. She meets a forger. She meets the other ladies. She gets the lowdown of what's going on. Um, and she's kind of put to work. So we have a few more scenes flashing back and forth between, you know, Jamie racing to get her and one of my immediate reactions, which by the way, if you're not following my Instagram, I always have that link down below. When I watch the episode, I do a few spoiler free live reactions. And this year I made a whole cool little template for it. Um, I think I still have one saved. So like, this is what it looked like if I didn't forget that I said anything, um, where I'm going to do reactions. So um, if you want to see those, you can do that. And I made a story, um, a highlight. So if you go, if you missed it, you know, cause it's gone already for my story. If you go to my profile on Instagram, you'll see one of the highlights says outlander things, and that will have my reactions for the episodes. So one of my reactions for this was there's a reason why a man riding in on a white horse is a trope. It's because it's awesome because Jamie's on his big white stallion and they are racing to get to Claire because they're afraid she's going to be hanged any minute. Now, um, the episode did also start with Claire. I, you know, forgot this of Claire kind of like having like a nightmare of her being hanged. Um, of course that doesn't actually happen there or anything. Um, but she has this nightmare of it and 
um, you know, that's kind of, I think, what Jamie is thinking is happening to her. So he's rushing to get to her. But the thing is, the courts are basically shut down because of the Revolutionary War and because of issues having and governors um, needing to be in hiding because they're getting attacked by the rebels and everything. And so Claire's discovering like, oh, okay, well, I'm probably not going to be killed immediately because they're just going to keep me in here indefinitely until they have a judge who can try my case. So it's a bit of like a mixed bag, right? Because it's like, well, she's still in jail, but also she's not under threat of being hung any moment and she knows her husband will come. Like, you know, she just knows that he's going to find a way to get to her. Um, so then we, at one point, break away to show what is happening with um, Roger and Bree. And we see that he's supposed to be going on um, kind of this like uh, trip with another minister to check on like prisoners of war and like be um, praying for people and everything and he runs into Wendigo Donner and now from Wendigo saying that you know speaking with him he realizes that this is the man who didn't help Claire and he's like I didn't know what to do I was scared if I had spoke out against him I would have been killed and then I wouldn't been able to help her you know but we know that you know he did a little bit more than that like he pretended to go along with everything that they were doing but also I like Wendigo is such a mixed like character for me even how I felt in the books particularly because I understand his cause and like what he wanted to do and I think that it is like a righteous cause but at the same way you know I care about our characters more and so you know when we have seen what happened to Claire and how she was abused it's hard to have sympathy for him you know and definitely even though Roger feels that tug you know of humanity the tug of being a minister and wanting to comfort this man you know when he speaks of him to Bree Bree is like that man did nothing and you saw how bad mama was like how can you want to help him and I'm kind of just rushing through Bree and Roger's story here since they have very like small scenes throughout this but eventually Roger says, okay, I'm not going to help him other than I'll pray for him. I'll pray that he is okay. And honestly, like, you know, I won't say we've seen the last of Wendigo yet. But I think that that's the right choice for Roger because I understand him wanting to help the man. And, you know, I think there is some of him thinking of himself of when he was held captive in a foreign time and you know he was going to be like an Indian slave at some point and all of these things and I think that's what he sees in Wendigo is wanting to help him but you know his wife is right too in that he didn't help mama and like we we have loyalty to Claire over what he maybe thinks that God would want him to do I don't know so, I don't know. And anyway, so that's kind of a lot of what we'll see of Roger and Brie in this one. And um, yeah, so Roger already coming up with more moral quandaries for him to stumble into um, in, you know, in becoming a minister here and everything. So moving along, um, then we have someone show up at the jail while Claire and the ladies are doing their work for the day. And we discover that there is a government the that they're in need of a surgeon and so they don't want to take the person who's charged for murder but the woman who is a forger says that she was the murderer so that claire is able to go on the ship um also she is the one they would need to help anyway so she ends up getting brought with and when she gets to the ship she discovers that the governor's wife who the governor is on a ship and they are a ways out to see so that they can't be attacked um, they've been like chased out of the governor's mansion by the rebels and everything and this governor and his wife the Martin I think it's governor Martin and mrs. Martin are on the ship and she is pregnant and sick and they have had six pregnancies before and they've lost quite a few of their babies and so you know they don't want that to happen this time and Claire promises to do her best and there's some you know talk back and forth of the lady being like oh, you're the murderess please don't hurt my baby promise you won't hurt my baby and Claire being like I didn't hurt this woman I didn't do what I was accused of um and I promise not to hurt your baby I'm only here to help and so they have some talk back and forth and um I mean, it was kind of cute because when she thinks she might be a murderess, she's a little bit more in awe of her than, than scared. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. 
So then we have Claire have an interaction with the governor and Major McDonald. And Major McDonald, I have him written as Major D-Bag McDonald because he blows the secret and is like, oh, I was so surprised to hear that Madam Fraser of Fraser's Ridge was accused of murder. And he just outs her. And so now the governor knows that the murderess was brought back to take care of his wife and not the forger. Um, and, <laughs> and Major McDonald just like totally blows the top off of it and then Claire and the governor have some kind of like tense back and forth because she's like is it true your husband might be a rebel and you know it's one thing if maybe you were a murderess because there can be reasons for murder but there's no reason for treason and this like back and forth with that um and so Claire has brought before so sorry speeding ahead because I'm excited Claire kind of like you know, shuts the governor down with that. And then it's like, I need supplies um, to take care of your wife. And I have a connection in, um, in the port. If you would get this list to him, he'll make sure I get the supplies. And so she sends a list for Tom Christie of supplies that she needs. And one of them includes um, my husband. And I think it's written in Latin or in a language that she knows Tom. Knows. And Claire doesn't know that Jamie is like already reached that town yet. Um, but when Tom gets this letter, he takes it to Jamie and is like, I know where your wife is. She's on the ship. So Jamie goes to the ship and there's a really beautiful thing of him saying, I am a former Indian agent and a friend to Lord John Gray. And they have this beautiful little reunion kiss. And then there's an awkward moment of like, you can't do that. She's a prisoner. So Jamie makes his case to the governor and he says, I'm here to get my wife. And he's like, she has been charged with murder. And he's like, but you're the governor, right? So you can pardon her. So you can just let me take her and it'll be fine. I promise she didn't do it. And I mean, of course we know that she didn't do it. And Jamie's trying to be his persuasive self, you know, and the governor, you know, he reminds me, he's like, you have the power to do this. Like, please let me have my wife. And the governor is like, are you trying to bribe me into this? And he's like, no, it'll be a, it'll be a bond. Like it's, it's a bond until my wife can have trial. Cause who knows when it'll be. Um, and the governor's like, no, but what you can do is you can go and you can round up some men to help quell what's going on out there. So basically he wants him to recommit to the crown and to help to prove that he's loyal to get Claire back. And so Jamie is like, okay, I'll go do that. When of course he has a different, he, you know, he doesn't want to have to do that, but he goes back to town. He has to leave Claire there and he goes back to town and he's trying to come up with something. And Tom comes up to Jamie and he says, let me help you. And Jamie's like, I don't need your help. I promised Claire on our wedding day that I would do everything I can with my home and my body and my blood. Like I will do it. Right. Those are the vows of like blood of my blood and bone of my bone. And Tom is like, if you let me help, you will be living out your vows if you let me help. And so Jamie's kind of like, you know, taken aback. And so Tom says he's going to confess to the murder of his daughter. And Jamie's kind of like, but didn't you? And Tom's like, let me do this. I can help Claire. Let me confess to doing this. And then Tom asked Jamie to give him a eulogy. What would you say at my death? Um, and Jamie's kind of taken back. He's like, when Malva had died, she sa she said what she would say at Malva's funeral. And I don't know what will happen to my body or where I'll be laid to rest. So what would you say of me? And Jamie, you know, he says good things about him. He's like, though we've never seen eye to eye, you are a man of honor and I'm glad to have known you. And it was a really touching moment. And we really start to see the good of Tom start to come out. And we'll see a bit more of it here in just a minute. Because then Tom goes to the ship and he asks to see Claire and he tells Claire that he's going to confess to killing his daughter. And she's like, you didn't kill her. And she's like, I, maybe I should have. And so he tells the history of Malva and that she isn't really his daughter. She was his, is his niece. Um, and that his wife, um, had been taken care of by his brother Edgar and that his wife was a witch and it's you know because Claire has heard his ramblings in the past she's like you mean your daughter not the witch and he's like no I'm telling you she was evil and we find out a lot of things we didn't know that um Tom knew that she was actually the one who poisoned him and Claire their illness was different from everyone else's and she'd actually used um those like finger bones of the uh 
of the sin eater to like make a potion that she you make a poison to kill them you know she took some of the knowledge that claire had shared about germs and things that could make you sick and put them into this and she wanted jamie um we'll get into more about the book side of that in a minute but you know we're we're in a more succinct version of this as the show tends to do but it is in my opinion a very true comparison but um tom also says that yeah he's going to confess to doing it and claire's like but you didn't you know like your work your life is valuable like you're going to throw it away and he says a very cool line i really like this line where he's like if my life wasn't valuable then i wouldn't be able to trade it for yours and that's what I'm going to do. Um, and he says that, you know, he spent his whole life looking for someone to love and he never found anyone who was worthy of it until Claire. And he says that he loves her. And then she's like, don't do this. And he calls for the guard. And then Claire gets sent back to town. We'll touch on this soon. I know I'm going through the episode touch of this so yeah so then we have Jamie and Claire back in their room and she's like you didn't make him do this right like you didn't force him and he's like no it was his idea he's in love with you that's why he did this and Claire's like you know I just can't believe that he did that so yeah so then Claire falls asleep and Jamie waits until she falls asleep and then he leaves and we discover that um the other brown brother is still there and so Jamie goes into his room and we have an amazing scene. I love this. I actually have the quote from um, the show written down because I loved how the scene was. Because um, it's, oh, it's showing another facet of Jamie that we don't see enough. But me as a book reader, I, lo I love every side of James Fraser. I love. So I loved seeing this. But Brown is like, oh, what are you going to do? And he's like, well, my nephew who you, you know, shun, or I can't remember what he says about Ian, um, him and his Indian kin are coming for you. And you're not going to know what hit you, basically. And Brown says to him, he's like, you're a good man, a moral man. And Jamie says, I'm also a violent man, and any goodness that prevails in me is because of my wife. You tried to take her from me. And Brown says, you won't kill me, not in cold blood. You wouldn't dare. And Jamie just says, make your peace with the Lord, Mr. Brown, if you must. And then it just shows Jamie lunging at him and it's credits. So yeah, that was episode one in the Jen condensed version for you. And before we get into the comparisons, how do I just like feel about this? Just to have watching it first experience. Um, I enjoyed this quite a bit. Um, a lot of my enjoyment does come from a lot of book accurate stuff because that is what I'm looking for. But as an episode back, I thought it was good. It's not the best premiere episode I've ever seen, but it definitely is, you know, answering a lot of questions that we left hanging. And in my opinion, we are still kind of like wrapping up season six, right? Because if we think back to it, we had a very short condensed season. Katrina Balfe was pregnant. Um, we had to cut the season down this season. Um, this one is supposed to be 16 episodes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I don't do a lot of the updates or keep up on like the minutia of everything, but I'm pretty positive this is supposed to be a 16 episode season. And then we're getting a season eight and that's supposed to be kind of the end of what we have. Um, and so for me, we're definitely still wrapping this up and we're going to get into like, I know that we are, um, because of which part of this book that we're in right now. Um, but I thought it was really well done. I love seeing my characters again and being there, but yeah, I do think that, yeah, it isn't the strongest premiere I've ever seen, but with the cliffhanger we were left at, we obviously had to deal with what we were left at. So I would give this maybe like a 7.5 or an 8 out of 10. Like I, I really enjoyed it. I don't have bad things, but I also want to leave some room because I think there's going to be some pretty spectacular episodes this season. So in my very own made up scale that I have just in my head, I would give this like a 7.5 and an 8 out of 10 because I want to leave us some room to grow for me. Um, in terms of book accuracy, I give this... I give this an eight, eight and a half out of 10. And we're going to talk about how it's different. Um, mainly a lot of differences have to do with, we definitely shifted some things around in the timeline a couple seasons back that are now coming to bear fruit. And we'll talk about that part of it. So, um, 
where we are in the book. So what was kind of crazy about this is, you know, I pulled out my copy here, which I have annotated quite heavily when I did my reread. And we actually begin um, this season midway through a chapter. We begin this like midway through um, chapter 90 in the book. We're literally like at this part of the book and we go to about here in the book. Sorry for my bookmarks there. Um, and we stay pretty true to it throughout this. So really the biggest kind of like differences I noticed with this is that number one, we missed out on some Fergus and Marsley stuff. So when Jamie makes it to this town, this is the town where Fergus and Marsley are. And so there is some conspiring that he does with them. It would have been nice to see them in this episode somehow, but it was a pretty crowded episode for what we had to get through. So I understand that. Also, um, Major McDonald isn't quite the douchebag in the book as he is in the episode. We've definitely made him much more of like a prick in the show. Like it's not that he necessarily helps Claire out, but he does agree, you know, to tell Jamie that she loves him and like tell her where she is in the book. Um, he doesn't really end up like, he isn't such a jerk to him. You know what I mean? Um, or a jerk to her. And so I don't know why we're kind of going that route, but that's kind of what happened. I mean, Claire has like major mcdonald is kind of a fool in the book you know and in the show they don't quite make him out as much of a fool he's like a semi level villain now and we'll see where that goes later on um so that's kind of a change also um what's different from the book but i actually like it is that the conversation that jamie and tom have we don't see we just see jamie leaving and there's this beautiful scene when he sees claire again and he, you know, tries to convince the governor to let him go. He has to leave. And so he says, but you'll see me before the night is over. Don't worry. And Claire actually is really pissed at the governor. And she like slams a knife down on the table and she calls him a bastard, which I really love. But she doesn't do. And then it skips ahead to Claire's POV again. And Tom Christie is getting on the boat. And then we have, you know, the scene that unfolds between them. So we don't have that scene between Jamie and Tom in the book, but I like it. I like it. We hear that referenced later, that scene referenced later when Claire's back with Jamie and Claire's like, did you force him? And he's like, no, he wanted to do it. But what also is different then is that the conversation with Claire and Tom is very similar. Him telling the backstory, him telling that you know, I knew she was a witch. I watched these things. It wasn't just me being paranoid. Like his, uh, his dead wife, she was trying to be a witch. It wasn't that she was a healer and people were misunderstanding. She was trying to do spells and fuck with people's lives. Like she really was trying to do that. It doesn't necessarily make her evil. It could have made her just a woman of her time trying to survive, but she was a bit like, let's say a gay list character. She was a bit like that where she was willing to step over other people to get what she wanted and she was willing to do that and she had put those thoughts into her daughter's mind. So we're seeing another side to Malva that, you know, where Claire was always worried about how Malva was being treated. Like we see her being beat by her father. We see her being, you know, kept from learning things by her father and why, you know, Tom is so suspicious of what Claire does as medicine, seeing her as a witch. And it's because he really did have a real life like experience with someone who was trying to be a witch, not just someone who was being misinterpreted as one. At least that's how I read it, right? And what is different, again, in the book is that Tom doesn't say that he loves her in this scene. He does kind of hint at it by saying this. He says, I've, I have yearned always for love given and returned, have spent my life in the attempt to give my love to those who are not worthy of it. Allow me this to give my life for the sake of one who is. So that was him saying that she was worthy of his love, but he doesn't say that he loves her, where in the episode he does say that. Um, in fact, there will, okay, we'll get to that in a second. So he doesn't say it at this point. It's actually Jamie who does say it, which that same conversation we see in the book is basically the same in the show where he's like, he loves you. And Claire's like, no, no, that can't be right. And he's like, no, he loves you. That's why he did it. So it's actually Jamie who, you know, Jamie, when he had talked with Tom, he can tell that Tom loves his wife. And he was willing to let Tom make that trade for his wife. Cause he's like, well, if he wants to do it, 
I'm not going to stop him from doing it because I want my wife back. Right. And Jamie also says, he's like, you know, you have to let a man make his choices. And he made this choice. Like I was going to try to break you out and get you. And he did this. So like, you're not a fugitive at all. Like he took the fall for you. And so, you know, in the book, Claire then asked further, she's like, Jamie, can we ever make it right? And he's like, well, the last is dead. So we can't make it right. And Claire points out, and this is something that I'm like, why did the show not point this out? She's like, yes, but Tom didn't kill her. So Jamie, who did? Who was it? Because it wasn't me and it wasn't Tom. No matter of this confession, it wasn't him. So who did it? And that's the question is, will the show, like, we have to know that, right? So I don't know how long they'll stretch it out or like how far that will go before we find it out. But that is a Chekhov's gun on the table. Like we have to know who did it. And Claire's bringing up the point that it wasn't me and it wasn't Tom. Who did it? Who, who killed this woman? Like who was really the father of this baby? Right? Um, yeah. So anyway, um, let's see, let's see, let's see anything else. I think that's kind of where it ends with this. And then, um, yeah, the, sh the book, then here is where we run into some issues, right? So some other changes that are happening, like at the, at this point in the book where we've rescued Claire, there's also some stuff going on with Brianna and Roger that already happened. Okay. Um, and this is the point in the book when Brianna gets kidnapped by Stephen Bonnet. She finds out she's pregnant and she tells Roger. So we find out about this pregnancy and then she gets captured by Stephen Bonnet. And we have kind of the same stuff that plays out that the show did, but much differently. So this was why back then in the episodes, when we had that storyline brought so far forward, it really bothered me that we wrapped up the Stephen Bonnet stuff so early because there's an entire more stuff that happens with Stephen Bonnet in this book. Um, so obviously they're going to be doing some other things with, with Roger and Brie. I don't know what will precipitate those or how we get to it, but that's where we are. So there is still, um, you know, if you see like this is, this one episode just covered this many pages of this book and we have this much left. However, the next section of the book is all about getting her back from Stephen Bonnet, which we won't be doing. So there's just kind of a few major things left to happen, which I won't spoil right here because I don't know how the show would do it. If you want to know my in-depth thoughts on this one, I'll put my, you know, detailed review of a heart, uh, uh, breath of snow and ashes up here, right? When I did this reread and annotated this, um, but yeah, I'm interested to see where it goes. So we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode review and breakdown for now because I don't have too many extra things to say. But it was so good to break down another Outlander episode with you. I hope you loved this. Make sure you like and subscribe these videos now. There'll be one a week whenever there's an Outlander episode. Like I said, next week it will probably also be a Tuesday. But then after that, it should be Mondays is the plan. So definitely um, set your alert so you get notified when I upload. And like I said, you can binge my Outlander playlist. It'll be up there for you whenever you're ready. So thank you so much for watching. It's so good to be back. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.